Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings a message of hope in Jesus Christ.
said, I will make you worthy through Jesus Christ. Paul writes to Timothy, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, 
God gives to us in those words. By God's grace, we are redeemed. By his grace, we are restored. Um, it, it just uh, brings something from our hearts, uh, a, a desire to say to the Lord, thank you. Even when we read that the cattle of a thousand hills belong to him and the gold and the silver, God says, is mine. And yet, allowing us to have a part in what he has given us to return to him and say from our hearts, we bring this offering to you. Scripture teaches us that we're to worship the Lord through the singing of songs and through the giving of our gifts. And so this morning we are preparing our hearts to do that very thing. And whether we come as the poor woman who had uh, little but gave it all or whether we come even as the right the uh, righteous uh, assuming uh, Pharisees who counted every penny they gave uh, God receives from us gifts of gratitude and thanksgiving let's pray together Heavenly Father our hearts are are overjoyed at the very thought of your redemption and what you've done for us we had a debt we could not pay and you knew that from before the foundation of the earth. And so in your great love and grace, your grace, Lord, you provided a way that we might have redemption and be restored. And so today we come from our hearts bringing these gifts, praying that you would let us become a part of what you're doing among us and before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you sing with us? When I fear my faith to fail, Christ to hold me fast. When I tempt to
sustains even when our hope gives up, you will not let go of us, Lord. Please hold us close to you. Lord, we love you. We pray that as Pastor Steve leads us through the book of John, that you'll bless this time. Open our eyes and our ears to see and hear what you are doing today, God. Uh, thank you for this time of worship uh, through song and now worship through the word. We ask your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, the church said, Turn to the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, we want to get you one. Please see us at the back. If you could walk out these doors, go to the starting point desk. And give us your name and let us know. We'll be sure and get you one this week. So as we look at the Bible together here in John chapter 11, we ended our text last week at verse 53 of chapter 11. Uh, just to kind of refresh our memory, the Sanhedrin has met. Jesus is officially at the top 
of their list of most wanted criminals. This time he has finally gone too far. Uh, he not only has healed the lame, restored sight to the blind, but now he's restored life to a dead man. He's pushed the limits of religious decorum. He's broken ranks. And to add insult to injury to these religious leaders, he did all of these good deeds without ever paying a dollar of tuition to their seminaries. Now, he's on the verge of persuading the people to worship God without their assistance. And if he's left to continue, he'll bring the wrath of the government, Caesar's vengeance upon them all, all of which means that this man Jesus is guilty. He's guilty of threatening the security of their religious professions and pensions. This man's got to go. That's where we left off last week. So let's pick up our text, John chapter 11, beginning in verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Okay, now pause there, because that's where we stopped. Now, from this point on, they've made plans to put him to death, so now it's official. Their mock trial has been held, and the sentence of death has been given. They just have to figure out how to do it. So they start making plans. Look, it says they plotted to put him to death. So Jesus, knowing that the time designated by the Father in the eternal plan of the Trinity had not yet fully arrived for his death, so he decided to lay low. Verse 54. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but he went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. In other words, he no longer walked about freely. Up until this point, he's been an itinerant preacher. He's been meeting in the synagogues. He's been meeting with the people on the hillsides in any context that he can, but now he no longer walks about freely. He no longer preaches out in the open among the Jews. Instead, he left the area of Jerusalem to, in a, to a, and he retreated to a wilderness village about 14 miles to the north to a small, remote settlement known that day as Ephraim. And so in seclusion with his disciples, this is where he decides to remain. Now, it's interesting and, and, and necessary for us to acknowledge at this point, his public ministry has finished. So for these three years, Jesus has walked, he's taught, he's healed, he's performed miracles, he's engaged with the people of every, in every context. But now we find him having made the decisive action of ending his public ministry. And so his public ministry now finished, Jesus isolates himself like a fugitive in a haven, safe for the final two months that lead up to the last Passover. Between verses 54 and verse 55, those two months pass. Now as we come into verse 55, it's March, and it's 30 A.D., now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. The Passover, let's make sure we understand what the, the Passover was a seven to eight day festival and it was one of three great feasts that brought the Jews from all over the country into Jerusalem. And it was customary for this feast for many to arrive early to come into the holy city before the festival began so that they could go through a process of purification to prepare themselves for the Passover week. Verse 56. And they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? So the question here that they're asking, that all the people are asking each other, is whether or not Jesus is going to surface again. He's been hiding out like a refuge, right? And so the question now is, as we come into Passover and everybody is making their journey and the pilgrimages are, are occurring, coming up to this holy city of Jerusalem, the question among the people is, is Jesus going to surface again? Will he show his face again or will he be too frightened to show up? 
Has fear gotten the better of him? And is this, and it's this, and is this why they haven't seen him in two months? Because he's been hiding out of fear? The tone of their questions suggests that they don't expect him to. They don't expect him to show up. And that maybe it sounds like they're a little bit disappointed. Because to many, he's become a little bit of a complicated celebrity at this point. He flew in from Galilee, raised his friend back from the dead, and then disappeared into seclusion again, and no one's seen him for two months. So there's at least a, a, a sort of, we'll call it delighted curiosity about whether or not he'll make another appearance while the crowds are back in Jerusalem. Notice what John says here. He says they were looking for Jesus. In other words, they kept looking for him. No doubt the resurrection of Lazarus has their interest in him peaked. They're wondering what else he might do if he shows up. Verse 57, now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might, look at that, arrest him. So he's officially wanted by the law. His picture's up on the post office wall. The Sanhedrin is fully determined to put him to death, and the word is officially out. The warrant for his arrest has been posted. He is, Jesus at this point, is public enemy number one. So the question is this, does he show up or does he hold up? Verse 1 of chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where, Je where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. In both the Gospels of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, we see that the dinner was held in the house of a man by the name of Simon the leper. Matthew and Mark give us that detail. That this Simon the leper is the very one who had been healed of his leprosy and has now opened his home to Jesus. Now let's pause here for just a minute and let's notice, let's just pay attention to what's happening as we turn now into chapter 12 and who it is that's at this dinner. Let's pay attention, first of all, to Lazarus. Lazarus is there. Now think about that for just a minute. This, this is the man who was literally dead and had been given his life back. Now, now, as I go through each of these, I want you to try to put yourself or at least see what it is we're looking at. This is a man, I want to say it again, this is a man who was dead. Not sick, not in a coma, not asleep, dead. And he's alive again. And there's Martha. And Mary, as we'll see in the next verse, the two sisters who had been filled with sorrow over their brother's death. So you got Lazarus over here, you got Mary and Martha over here, and these two sisters who had been filled with sorrow over their brother's death, are now, who are now comforted to have him return from the dead, are seated at this table. And then you see Simon. So you got Lazarus, who was dead and now he's alive. You got Mary and Martha who were in sorrow and grief, and their griefs relieved by Jesus at the raising of, the, of their brother from the dead. Now you've got Simon, the man healed of leprosy, that dreadful disease that lingered for years. The dreadful disease that caused the tissues to degenerate, deforming and decaying the body. We don't know how far the disease had progressed for Simon. What we do know about Simon, because of the nature of the disease, is that he was terminally ill. There was no cure known for leprosy. He had no hope of recovery. It was a devastating disease that would attack the nervous system and spread through multiple skin contacts by coughing and squeeze, uh, sneezing and all these different types of things, how it would transfer to others. Therefore, he would ultimately be desensitized to any kind of touch, any kind of pain. He would be ostracized from everyone that he knew, everyone that he loved, until finally, and this was his certain destiny, he would die alone. 
But Jesus healed him. So we have Lazarus there, a man raised from the dead by Jesus. You have Martha and Mary there, comforted from their sorrow by Jesus. And Simon is there, a man who had been as good as dead, now delivered and made whole by Jesus. And they've all gathered in this man's home. Now, in six days, the entire nation is going to reject him. But this man who owes everything to Jesus, this man, Simon, opens his home to him. What, what do you imagine the feel of the room was at dinner that night? I, I mean, step into the room. You got Lazarus and Mary and Martha, you got Simon. What, what do you think the feel of that room was that night when all these people whose lives had been miraculously rescued? By Jesus, when they all gathered together with him, after he'd been away for two months. What do you think it was like for Martha and Mary, whose brother had been dead for four days, who had felt the sting of their loss and the fear of an uncertain future, but whose lives had been mended when Jesus raised their brother from the dead? What do you think it was like that night for, for them to be with Jesus again? What about Lazarus? A man who had fallen ill and died but was given breath again to live and to love, to live in community with others. What do you think it was like that night for Lazarus to be with Jesus again? What do you think it was like for Simon, a man who according to the laws of Israel was as, like a dead man because of his disease? The man who is outside of everyone's touch but is now seated again among fr these new friends and the, the very man who gave him life again. What do you think it was like that night for Simon to be with Jesus? Imagine what the feel of that room was like that night for these people. Now, now, now picture what it must have looked like. They're, they're with Jesus. All of their history now resolved in this one man. And they're reclining at the table, eating with the very one who has restored to them life. Certainly, certainly it must have been thrilling at least, right? For one of them, though, it just seems to have been too much. It just seems like it was overwhelming. Verse 3. Mary. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and she anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, there's a couple of things in this verse I want to make sure we notice. First of all, the first thing we want to notice here is that what she did was a lot and it was expensive. Matthew says that she brought, and he called it an alabaster, alabaster flask of very expensive anointment. That's how Matthew describes it. John gives us more detail. He says it was a pound, about, and that's about a half a liter. He has a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. Nard is a fragrant oil from Tibet. Tibet's that northern part of India that's drawn from what's called the spike nard plant. Nard is a very expensive ointment to the tune of about 300 denarii, which incidentally would have been equivalent to about a year's salary, an average salary. For a first century Jewish woman, it would have been not only her prized possession, it would have been her life savings. She would have typically mixed it to make her perfume one part to 50. So she'd take one part nard and then dilute it 50 times. So theoretically, a woman, if that's the case, a woman could mix it, use it all her life, and still have left over to pass on to her children. That's how valuable this was for a first century Jewish woman. The second thing to notice in verse 3, at least know as we consider its implications, is that this was pure nard. Because it was so expensive, nard was often mixed with inferior oils. It was diluted, but then sold at full cost. Have you ever bought perfume on eBay? They dilute it. And they spread it out. And so they'd sell it at full cost, but they'd 
sell it as a counterfeit to the real thing. This was pure nard. John says that what she brought was no counterfeit. It was the real. It was as her most precious possession and all of it. The third thing that we notice in verse 3 is that when she anointed Jesus' feet with it, Mark tells us that she broke her jar to do it. Matthew says that she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. In other words, Mary didn't merely dip into the perfume for a little bit. She didn't just scoop out just some of the nard. She didn't carefully pour it out just to get a measured amount. She didn't just empty the jar. She broke it. And she gave it all to Jesus. And then the fourth thing we notice here is that in an act of utter humility, now try to imagine the scene here, in an act of utter humility, Mary is kneeling at Jesus' feet at the lowest possible place before him. She's kneeling at his feet with the anointing oil pouring over his head, and she pours it over his feet, and then, listen to this, she takes her hair. The hair... For a first century Jewish woman, for anyone in that century, and likely even today, a woman's hair is the glory of a woman's beauty. So she takes her hair. She's kneeling at his feet, the lowest possible place that she can be before him. She's taken the oil. She's poured it over his head. Now she pours it over his feet. And she kneels before him. She takes her hair and she unbinds it. Something that no Jewish woman would have ever done in public. It would have been a disgrace for a woman to take the glory of her hair and let it down. But she takes it, she unbinds it, and she wipes the oil all over his feet. Now, now, now think about that for just a minute. Picture it. Close your eyes if you have to. Just see the image of what has just happened. Simon has opened up his home and the whole place is filled with people. Lazarus has just been raised and everybody wants to see the man who's been dead for four days and now is alive. Jesus is right in the middle of the room and everybody is trying to clamor after him. Simon, who was once a leper, but now he can touch people. He's at the front door. He's greeting people. He's shaking hands. Come on into my home. The disciples are mingling around the room. Martha's going back and forth from the kitchen to the living room, from the living room to the kitchen, back and forth. She's bringing in food. She's making everyone comfortable. And Jesus is reclined at the table. He's soaking it all in. And sitting at his feet is this very common woman with a very common name, Mary. And something clicks. It's as though she discerns something's, something's getting ready to happen. It's like she knows something ain't right. Everybody else, man, they're doing their thing. They're in their places. But Mary, there's just something different. She knows something's not right. Maybe she recognizes. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. But maybe, maybe in her mind, she she recognizes this man's getting ready to die. He's about to be put to death. And so oblivious to the crowd that's around her, oblivious to the disciples, to her brother, to her sisters, or anyone else in the room, she takes this alabaster jar and she empties it all over his feet and the whole room is filled with that aroma. Imagine how the room responds. There's all this activity going on and then all of a sudden, there's this fragrance. And all the attention comes to Jesus. Oh. 
All these people are there. All these people who are reclining at the table. All these people that are there who owe their lives to him, or owe their joy to him. The Lazarus, the sisters, Simon, the disciples, all these people. Among all, now listen, among all these people, who do you want to be the most? Don't you want to be Mary? Don't you want to be the one who sees his beauty? Don't you want to be the one who considers the best of what you have as plain and unlovely in his presence so much that its only valuable use is to be used to wash and anoint his feet? Don't you want to be Mary? We can only imagine the reaction in the room when she did it. We can only, we can only speculate on how everyone responded because they don't tell us. Because that's not the point. John only tells us about the reaction of one person. <laughs> Verse 4. But Judas Iscariot. You've got to say it like that, don't you? <laughs> but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? What a pill. Isn't that odd? Considering the image of the scene that we just visualized in our minds that, that John tells us, and then out of nowhere, here comes Judas, and he says, why didn't we sell that? Pious people. Reverent, devoted people. Often get rebuked by religious people. Judas was the treasurer, the money keeper, the one in charge of the finances. So when, he, when we read his reaction, it shouldn't surprise us. In fact, we should expect him to at least consider the cost. I mean, that's fair. At least consider the cost of what was being spent. But John doesn't leave us to give him so much credit, does he? Verse 6, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Judas was a thief. He was in Bezler all along. That's why he wanted the money. Because he was greedy. He wanted to use it for his own purposes. He wanted to skim some off the top for himself, just like he did with all the rest of the offerings that came in. Verse 7, Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. In other words, I'm not going to be with you much longer. I've been telling you this for a while now. I'm about to die, be resurrected, and I'm going to leave this planet. Now, one of the things I love about verse 7 is, is that first those first three words. Because I love it that the first thing Jesus says, the first thing that we hear out of his mouth at, the, at this part is leave her alone. And the actual translation says, leave her alone, you varmint. Because <laughs> that's exactly consistent with what the Bible says that Jesus does for me and you. He defends us. In fact, in Revelation, John would later say, and I heard of a loud voice in heaven, heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and our authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. You know who defends us against our accuser? Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus in heaven when the enemy is accusing you before the Father? And Jesus saying, leave him alone. Amen. Leave her alone. That's what happens, I think, in heaven. I love that. Verse 8, for the poor you have always with you, but you do not always have me. Can Christians get so caught up in the detail of doing good deeds, serving others, 
leading worship that they forget or at least fail to recognize who it is that they're honoring? Is that possible? You betcha. Yeah. So what are we going to learn from this passage? There's a lot of hubbub right now over what place good deeds and behaviors have with respect to our relationship with Christ. There's a uh, great conference that takes place every year that John MacArthur hosts called the Shepherds Conference. And uh, this, this uh, every year you think, well, how, how long, much longer can he keep doing these? And of course, that's the question this year as his health is struggling and his, uh, uh, he's growing weary and, and different things. He's been under a great attack and he carries the, the weight of a lot of theological foundation on his shoulders. We're very thankful for John MacArthur. But anytime this Shepherds Conference comes around, this particular issue seems to surface again, and it is surfacing now, because John MacArthur has taught what we refer to as lordship salvation. That if you're a Christian, then Jesus is going to be Lord of your life. It's not just the kind of thing where you just, well, yeah, I, I prayed a prayer and I'll just go on with my life. And there's going to be something different about you that's going to follow. It's going to change. And with today's rising theologians, a lot of them are questioning whether or not that's as they have for centuries, whether or not that's legitimate or whether or not it's biblical. And so for many, the question that still remains unanswered is, is salvation simply believing with no other variables considered? In other words, is it legitimate to insist that fruit follows faith, that our faith is somehow tied to the proof that we give it after we've believed, that without the evidence of good works, our salvation is in question. Is it, is it legitimate to ask that question or insist on that? So for the question for many is, what is proper, expected, and necessary in response to believing in Christ for salvation? That, that's kind of the question. What, what should the Christian life look like? What, what, what should a Christian response be to what Christ has done in giving us salvation? So the question for many, then, is what's appropriate? What's necessary? What's, what should it be? When John speaks of believing in Christ, he speaks of believing for faith. And this is what it means. So when the Bible talks about faith... For salvation, this is what the Bible says, that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died as your substitute, that you were guilty for your sin, that payment had to be made on your behalf, that you no longer trust in you, you no longer trust in your efforts or the reputation of someone else to make things right, that you admit your sin and own it as your own and you stop convincing yourself that God is just going to look past your guilt that you deserve judgment and you cannot escape it. And against all of that, you transfer all your trust to Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible, that's what the Bible tells us about believing for faith, about what it means to be a Christian. That God so loved the world that His only Son, the only begotten he gave with this purpose, that whosoever, those who receive him with abiding trust and confidence may have e eternal life. So the question then, I think, is we need to ask, who are these whosoevers? It's very simple. A whosoever is someone who believes in Christ for eternal life is someone who, number one, three things, number one, understands the problem and the solution. Number two, gives assent to its truth. And number three, puts their faith entirely in it. That's what it means. Very simple. Those are the whosoevers. 
So whoever believes from every tribe, every nation, every generation, every age, that man and woman, boy or girl, has eternal life. So against the backdrop of Judas's protest to Mary's response, consider these three things about Mary's response to Christ as we try to answer and resolve these issues. Number one, notice that Mary gave her best. She gave her life, her glory, her status, her estate. She gave the best that she had in her possession. She gave it to Christ. No holds barred. She didn't go back to the back room and say, well, I like this. But I don't know, I, kinda, I can't think I can get away with this. She gave it the best that she had, and she gave it to him. Number two, she gave it all. She gave her best, and she gave it all. What she gave will never be used again. Because remember, she broke that flask. She didn't pull the cork. She broke the top off of it. It will never be used again. She poured everything she had out for Christ and she held nothing back. She gave her best and she gave it all. So when we give to God, the important thing for us to understand is that that gift no longer belongs to us. It's His and we no longer have claim over it. So is our lives. When we give our lives to Christ, he has claim over it. And we no longer have claim over ourselves. Romans 10, 9. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in your heart God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Number three. And I think this is, to me, the most raw of the three. And that is Mary's hair, a woman's glory, the very best she can boast of, becomes a rag for Jesus' use. You see that? For Mary, her hair is, it's everything she's got. It's her glory. Culturally, <clears throat> physically, whatever, it's her beauty, it's everything. For her, her hair is everything. And when she kneels down before Jesus and she takes the best of what she has, she gives it all to him and she unbinds her hair and she brings it down, what is so wonderful for her becomes a rag in its service to Jesus. Question. How did Mary come to understand all of this when all these other people, particularly the disciples, have been following him intimately, listening to him. How did Mary catch this when everybody else failed to? And here's the answer. Because Mary was often in the place where we find her right here, at Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her hair. Every time we see Mary, read through your scripture, every time we read, see Mary, she's at Jesus' feet worshiping him and learning from him. Every single time. It's where we find her in Luke 10 when Jesus comes to visit. It's where we find her in the first part of John chapter 1 when Jesus returned following the death of Jesus. She came to Jesus' feet. She fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been there, my brother wouldn't have died. Rather, chapter John 11, my, my brother would not have died. You remember? She's at his feet every time we see her. And this is where she is now. Worshiping him with nothing less than her all. And Matthew tells us that Jesus said, now listen, here's what Matthew says Jesus says about her worship. If you're on the fence at this point, you're saying, yes, pastor, that's good for that person. I'm just not that kind of a person. That's not my personality. 
Let me tell you what Jesus thinks about her kind of person. He says, truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. In other words, what she just did, this thing that, G that Mary just did, this is what a Christian should be doing. So here's how I'd close. This hubbub about faith and what our lives should look like afterwards, let me tell you this, and let me put it as blunt as I possibly can. The question isn't how much I, must I give. The question is not how much must I do, how much is enough, or how much is not enough. In fact, I'd say if you're asking those questions, that's a problem. Because here's the answer. Give your best, give it all, and place it at his feet. That's how a person is supposed to respond to what Christ has done. No less than all. Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, remembering the words of our Savior about Peter, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. In that, we can all identify. I find myself, Lord, more often identifying with Peter than I do with Mary. Or Simon, even. Blessed and thankful for all that you've done for me, but oblivious of the fact that you're in the room. Or Martha, busy with serving and doing, oblivious to who it is that she's serving. This Mary. Her entire being, God, surrendered to you. Every possession, every emotion, every desire, every want, every will, all of it surrendered to you. Dear God, help us to see in this example what it is you call us to be and to do. And it's to give it all. I thank you, Lord, that you're not a bean counter. You're not up in heaven or wherever you might reside in our presence that you count the deeds to ascribe to our worthiness of salvation. Instead, you paid it all to its fullest cost and told us to take your yoke to lay ours on you and to walk as you would walk. Lord, help us to be faithful in that. Help us, Lord, I pray, pray to rest under the blessing of your sovereignty, to find peace and hope in your providence, to find joy in knowing that there is no competition. Christ has done all that can and must be done. Help us to find peace in that, Lord, I pray. For the one who's here this morning, who's far from you, who feels far from you, who's caught up in the busyness, who's been somewhat disillusioned perhaps by religion or by the demands of others, speak peace to their hearts, Lord, I pray. Show them, Lord, the contrast between your great holiness and our and the ugliness of our sin and show them God the open path that leads to salvation through Christ help them Lord I pray and I ask you Lord for their salvation in Jesus name and for all this Lord we would ask for those who know you and trust you that Father this would strengthen our faith to love you, to serve you, and to want to do so. 
Let it be, Lord, I pray, that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org. 